want to go back to your to discuss the time that you spent as director of the laboratory and ask you about non-metallurgical problems. You became the director at a very young age, 42, I believe. Right. What was it like to go from a scientist to director of the laboratory three years before the fall of the Berlin Wall? Surely there had to be a lot of, a lot of non-metallurgical problems that, <laughs> that you had to deal with. What was the on-the-job training like for that? So it was um, like being thrown into the ocean, <laughs> sort of jumping in. So I, I, I would say all those other, you know, metallurgical materials, uh, scientific problems, uh, were pretty simple <laughs> you know, compared to um, uh, to the directorship problems. Uh, so so first of all, I, I I would say, you know, from my standpoint, uh, there was a good part uh, of that job that I was totally unprepared for, uh, because I really had not dealt uh, internationally uh, in the policy uh, arena, you know, with other countries. Uh, I certainly had dealt internationally uh, with the UK and then some with the French uh, in terms of uh, materials, weapons-related programs, and things of that nature. Um, uh, we had good interactions on materials with the French. Of course, the U.S. had a, a, a very intense collaboration with the U.K., uh, and, um, and I worked on that uh, for many years. Uh, but uh, I was not uh, involved in, in the policy, diplomacy, any of those things. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, it wasn't... Uh, I'd mentioned before, you know, I'd really had uh, had hoped that I had hoped eventually, it, you, you know, I would become a university professor. So this business of laboratory directorship was not on my screen. Uh, you know, I I never I never wanted to be director. I never even thought of being director of this laboratory. Uh, but I had done internally within the laboratory, as I had mentioned before, sort of eighty one or so. Uh, it was the first time I started taking some management responsibilities, and, and that happened. Uh, the the new director that came in in 1980, Don Kerr, uh, he set up a number of working groups, and one of them was material science working group. Uh, and for whatever reasons, uh, I was selected to chair that working group. So I chaired that working group, tried to understand uh, the importance of materials uh, uh, to the laboratory and the importance of materials to the whole nuclear complex uh, and what it meant. Uh, and so that was sort of my introduction of reaching out beyond my own interest uh, into the laboratory. And I, I really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed the challenge of trying to put the pieces together. I've always enjoyed that. Uh, sort of take the pieces, put them together, and then try to lay out a sensible path forward. Uh, and so one of the paths forward from that was actually to try to rejuvenate uh, material science at this laboratory. The technology is throughout all of the laboratory programs. Uh, essentially, there's nothing you can do you know, without materials. Of course, whether it's the weapons program, nuclear energy program, whether it's the space power program, or fusion program, for example. You know, this laboratory has worked on, uh, on, uh, on fusion, thermonuclear fusion. Uh, uh, civilian thermonuclear fusion. All of those have enormous materials challenges. And we still had that, but we had sort of lost the fundamental base. A and so then we wound up setting up the Center for Material Science uh, in 1981 time frame. I, was, I had become, uh, through a couple of steps, uh, the leader uh, of what was initially called CMB Division, uh, changed the name. The CMB stood for Chemistry, Metallurgy, Baker. Baker was the division leader. Uh, and uh, uh, Baker was retiring. Uh, I eventually wound up as division leader. I called the Material Science and Technology Division. At that time, that had all of the major materials activities that laboratories, all the plutonium activities, all the uranium activities, uh, and sort of all of the non-nuclear related activities. Uh, so I was running a division uh, of about uh, 700 people. 
Uh, so this was now uh, 19, uh, became division 1983. So I left General Motors in 1973 because I didn't want to become a manager. <laughs> so 10 years later, um, I'm here running a 700 person division, but still very, very interested uh, in, um, in the technical aspects of all of that and try to, try to keep my hands in the technical aspect. And so what I actually did, now this is just to sort of lead up as how, how in the world did I get into the directorship? I know I'm not answering your question directly, uh, but I think it's important. So um, uh, by the time uh, uh, I was then leading up to that, and I said, uh, you know, so here I am at that point, you know, I was like 41 years old. I said, I don't want to run this 700 person division. Y you know, I had some colleagues there. I said, they can run this division. I, I want to go back to the research world. So I had then headed up uh, the Center for Material Science. Uh, you know, so instead of having 700 people, you got a dozen people, lots of visitors, lots of excitement. Go do your own research again. And so that was July 1st uh, of 1985. Uh, well, in um, late September, uh, I had a visitor uh, from University of California because our then director, Don Kerr, uh, decided uh, to, to leave. Uh, he went out into industry. And so they were looking for a new director. They came and interviewed me for what, what should we look for in a director. And so I gave them a long list of saying, this is what you need for a director. Then I got a call, uh, you know, maybe a month or a little later, and they asked me if, it, if I would be interested in being director. And I said, no. <laughs> I, and they said, why? I said, well, I don't meet my own qualifications. You know, I just set all of this out for you. And you know, I've never been around the world, in the diplomatic world. I don't do much with, I've never done much with Washington. Uh, you, you know, clearly, I, um, that's, that's not who you want for a director. Uh, and the University of California essentially said, why don't you let us decide that? Uh, so I said, well, that's reasonable. So at any rate, I wound up being director. Uh, never wanting to be director. So that transition uh, was immense. Uh, you know, not immense in terms of internal at the laboratory. Uh, I think there I actually sort of had a leg up uh, because I really knew how this, this laboratory functioned. You know, so this is 1986 by the time I became director. Uh, and I first came here, as I said, as a student in 1965 came back in a postdoc and then as staff member in 1973. So I'd been here, I knew how the laboratory worked. But the interaction then with Washington and then what you asked, you know, as the Soviet Union starts falling apart. So that was, that was an enormous uh, challenge. It was quite clear by that time uh, that something uh, you know dramatic was happening in the Soviet Union. So I became director uh, January 15th of 1986. And just to give you an idea of the first year, uh, in uh, uh, late in January, the uh, shuttle Challenger uh, blew up. Uh, and that gave you sort of a jolt as saying that some high-tech systems uh, can fail. Uh, in April, uh, Chernobyl blew up. So I had a nuclear reactor blow up. Uh, in between, uh, FBI came to see me to tell me you had a Chinese spy at your laboratory, which then turned out to be a whole another story. Uh, so, um, and then in addition, uh, uh, President Reagan had been building up the defense budget. Uh, and then they had the first sequestration in April of 1986. Uh, so now I'm faced with the fact we're going to get a budget cut. By October of 1986, Reagan and Gorbachev get together and say, why don't we get rid of nuclear weapons? And I said, how's that for job security? <laughs> you know, I've been on the job for one year, and these guys are you know, talking about getting rid of. Uh. So they didn't get rid of nuclear weapons, uh, but eventually that led uh, to getting rid of, uh, of the Soviet Union, so uh, it collapsed. Uh, and so then, um, then my life then revolved around these sort of basic changes that were happening. So it wasn't only, I mean, the biggest change by far was how do you adjust to the fact that more or less what you would consider the main reason for your existence, you know, nuclear weapons to deter the Soviet Union, and that other side has just gone belly up. Uh, you, you know, how do you make that adjustment? And, um, and that adjustment, you know, over years, and we're still, uh, we're still essentially in that adjustment period as to 
what do you do? How do you redefine? What do you now need from the laboratory? What, what's important? Uh, and so my, my major job was then, how do, how do we make sure that our laboratory is prepared to do whatever it takes in whatever is going to come down the road? Uh, and, and there, even though the, you, know, you say I was young, I didn't think I was young then. You know, as I look back now, I said, yeah, I was young. You know, My kids are older than that, for heaven's sakes. Uh, but it, it was actually, as I look back now, I would actually say it was a good thing I was young uh, because I didn't know what can't be done. Uh, and so we had these challenges. You, you know, we had the Soviet Union going away, the country thinking it's going to get a peace dividend, the country not realizing that the peace dividend was going to be peace. It wasn't going to be a whole bunch of money. Uh, and so we had to make that adjustment. And, and out of that came sort of this whole concept of stockpile stewardship uh, of, you know, the question was indeed why, I mean, I went to congressional hearings. Why do we still, from the senators, congressmen, why do we still need you in the laboratory, you know, build nuclear weapons? You know, our world has changed. <clears throat> so uh, we then packaged that into saying, look, uh, our job is stockpile stewardship. You know, got to make sure as long as countries' policies are to need nuclear weapons for whatever reason, <clears throat> we're going to make sure they're safe, secure, reliable. You know, that's, that's our job. And then what President Clinton added, <clears throat> and you have to do that without nuclear testing. A and nuclear testing had been our bread and butter, I you know, for all of those years. Uh, because as much as we could do with computers, as much as we did with theory, with modeling, simulation, in the end, it was always the experimental manifestation that really informed us best. So we defined a new challenge, uh, and I thought that went pretty well. But in addition, and, and, and then uh, I would say we did that uh, quite well. The part that was much, much more difficult uh, is that our relationship uh, with the public changed completely uh, at the same time. Uh, and our relationship with the regulators changed completely. Uh, and that is, as long as the Soviet Union was there, um, we sort of had some, I guess you could call it, immunity. Uh, and that is, the country knew that it needed us. Uh, and there were certain things that we had to do in, in the conduct of our business uh, that were hazardous. Uh, and of course, since we lived here, since our families lived here, uh, we always thought, of course, the most important thing is to do that from a, and do it safely. But nevertheless, the whole regulatory business just changed enormously uh, when the Soviet Union went away. And, and I would say today, you know, so we're now, we're talking 30 years later, we have not yet recovered from that. So I think one of my greatest challenges uh, as director was how do you adjust uh, uh, to that new regulatory framework? How do you adjust to the new interface with the public? I mean, before, essentially, you know, more or less, Los Alamos and the other weapons labs sort of said, hey, you know, you, you can't look in here. You, you know, the stuff that we do, it's here because of the Soviet Union. Then all of a sudden, the doors blew open and, and the public didn't particularly like uh, what it saw. Uh, and so one of my greatest challenges there then was how do you go out in, into the community how do you go through a three-hour hearing you know, at the state legislature or a two-hour public hearing where they want to go get those big bad guys from, uh, from Los Alamos? Uh, and so I, I would say all of that, you know, I had to, to learn on the job. You know, how well it's done, it's still difficult today. You say that stockpile stewardship started under your tenure as director. That was 26 years ago since the last U.S. atomic test. Do you think stewardship is still a valid approach versus remanufacturing? Or has the science still able to certify the weapons? So the, the, the last nuclear test was uh, in on my watch as director September 23rd uh, 1992. And it was actually interesting, you know, we had ways uh, of giving the tests names. And some of them were cities in West Texas or lots of other things. This one was called Divider. 
Uh, and what was interesting, as you look back now, it actually was a divider. It was a divider between the era when we used to be able to do nuclear testing and then this whole new uh, era of stockpile stewardship. Uh, so I, I would uh, sort of change your, your question a little bit to say, is it a, a matter of stockpile stewardship or remanufacturing? That is stockpile stewardship. So stockpile stewardship is the whole thing as to how in the world do you make sure that, that we're able to retain all the things we need to deter our adversaries, whoever they may be. And of course, we had a huge nuclear arsenal you know, of, of tens of thousands uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's been drawn way down. So first of all, we have many fewer nuclear weapons. Second biggest change uh, is that you can't test them anymore. And so then the stewardship challenge was uh, how, do, how do we deal with that? And the way that I always divided it is, um, oh, and, and then I, I should have added also, it wasn't just no nuclear testing. Actually, George H.W. Bush uh, in October of 1992, uh, he actually uh, set the policy for the country uh, which said, and we will not develop nuclear weapons with new capabilities. So it essentially said no nuclear weapons. Okay, So no nuclear weapons with new capabilities and no testing. But you guys take care uh, of this in the meantime. All right, so then now, so the, the way that uh, I divided the world uh, in, in, the, in the nuclear stewardship business, so you can remanufacture. That was not disallowed. So we could remanufacture the nuclear weapons you know, to the way we had them. Uh, or uh, you could actually then uh, extend the lifetimes of, of those weapons. Now, the weapons you more or less have to appreciate was sort of uh, designed for a lifetime of, of a decade plus. Uh, and, and not that they would fall out of certification, but we usually replace them with a new model. And so you replace them with a new model, so you never really thought you're going to have to worry about a weapon you know, past a decade, maybe at most uh, two. So all of a sudden, now with life extension, we're talking about weapons that have been in a system more than 30 years. Uh, well, when we worried about plutonium properties, and what's that plutonium going to do? Uh, uh, we didn't worry about 30-year lifetimes uh, at that point. Uh, and so, so that is an enormous challenge. It's not only the, the plutonium is sort of the most important part, because a lot of the rest of the stuff that goes into weapons, uh, that you can test. Uh, you know, and you can replace, you can test. The part that you can't test, you can't make it go boom. You, you, you know, you can't do the nuclear implosion. Uh, and, and that means the plutonium and all the things associated with the plutonium. Uh, so to extend the lifetime uh, of those things is an enormous challenge. You would think then, okay, so why don't we just go and reproduce? That ought to be simpler, right? There are blueprints. Blueprints have dimensions. They have materials that just reproduce. But what, what the public doesn't understand, and, and of course it's not surprising because we never talk so much about this, uh, is that the, the plutonium components that go into weapons were produced at a place called Rocky Flats uh, in Golden, Colorado. Uh, that was the only place in the United States that could make those plutonium components. The, the reasons that I just told you for the regulatory world changing all of our lives is they actually changed the lives of the production facilities much faster than the lives at the laboratories. We were still somewhat protected. In the production facilities, now you go to places like Rocky Flats, Hanford, Savannah River, and, and others that provided uh, uranium enrichment capabilities. For the most part, those started to be closed one after another. And Rocky Flats actually, in June of 1989, was raided by the FBI, never to be opened again. And so all of a sudden, 1989, we're sitting there not able to make another plutonium component. Uh, and, and, and so I was director at that time, you know, so at the worst. So what do we do now? Well, we have the only other plutonium facility, but it was built, what we call TA-55 plutonium facility. Uh, it was built to be an R&D facility. There were times when we had to draw it in to do sort of bigger productions, but not for plutonium components. It was mostly for plutonium uh, 
chemical uh, related uh, uh, processing. So we said, well, we, you know, maybe we can take this R&D facility. It wasn't meant to do production, but maybe we can make a few, you know, a few tens or so. And so we start to re sort of configure TA55, seeing what we can do. Uh, and then, and, and this is where the metallurgy uh, comes in and the training from case, you know, from all the other places comes in. So then we have this problem. Then <clears throat> the way that the plutonium components were made at Rocky Flats uh, were actually such that metallurgically um, didn't produce a product that I would be terribly happy with. Unless you can test them all the time. If you can test them, it's okay. But if you can't test them, there are better ways to do those. The equipment was huge. It was essentially impossible to take into R&D facilities, so we had to do it differently. And doing it differently, metallurgically, uh, you know, then one worries about, you know, the metallurgist always worries uh, about, um, so you have the processing, you know, you have properties. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you have processing, the structure, and the properties, and that determines your performance. And so, so then we really have to start digging into the metallurgy uh, of plutonium in much greater depth than we had before in order to say, can we use a different processing technique in order to still provide the proper performance? Well, on the performance end, you can't test anymore, by the way, okay? So you're sort of stuck with that. So, so that was a challenge. And then on the life extension, uh, again, what's generally not uh, appreciated is, uh, of course, everyone knows uh, that things age, you know. I age, you know, plutonium ages even faster than I age. You know? So, so uh, things age, uh, and and they typically, you know, if you, you get steels, uh, you worry about rusting, right? And so you rust and you age from the outside in. So you have to understand oxidation, uh, or the combination of oxidation and hydriding, which is the sort of things we have to worry about in the nuclear arena: you know, oxidation, hydriding, uh, and even those steels. Some steels rust very fast. It turns out plutonium puts them to shame. I mean, it just it can rust incredibly fast unless you control the environment. Uh, and but now the other thing that plutonium does that the steels don't do, and essentially most of the other materials, certainly none of the other structure materials, uh, it ages from the inside out, and that is it's constantly transforming itself uh, through radiation. So this alpha radiation <coughs> that plutonium undergoes constantly actually transforms the materials. It builds in americium uh, and uh, uranium, helium. It, it actually creates helium inside the plutonium itself. And so if you just look at that in a simplified fashion, you say there's no way plutonium should last. Well, it turns out uh, it lasts reasonably well you know, from what we can tell. Again, we can't test it. And so we've studied. So, so that whole arena then of plutonium metallurgy and aging, so either refabrication, understanding, you know, processing structure properties, uh, or aging, understanding, you know, radiation, self-induced radiation damage, understanding hydriding, understanding oxidation, then that precise, um, really presented one of the biggest challenges to, to stockpile stewardship. The second challenge was then, since you can't test, uh, is can we predict better? Uh, can we model it better? Can we simulate it better? Uh, and for that, we needed big computers. And there we had uh, sort of the, the, the federal godfather of stockpile stewardship uh, was this fellow Victor Rees. Uh, he was assistant secretary for defense programs in the Department of Energy in the early 90s when we were developing this. Uh, and, and it was one of the best examples ever uh, of a federal uh, laboratory partnership. Uh, he knew he needed the laboratories. We knew we needed him. He knew how to essentially promote this in Washington to get the support uh, that one needed to do stockpile stewardship. And so now to get to, uh, to your question, so has it been successful? Uh, so, so far uh, we've done enormously well in improving the scientific underpinnings of everything that goes into nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons performance. But we have not yet demonstrated that all the practical aspects that go with that can actually be taken care of. And so we continue to do that, and it's a year-by-year -year situation today, this year. 
the answer is the laboratory directors will sign a certification that goes to the president that says the nuclear weapons that we put into the system, meaning Los Alamos and, and Lawrence Livermore, supported by Sandia, they're safe, they're secure, and they're effective. Directors have to sign. I signed the first two in 1986, 1996, 1997. They're still signing those today. That's sort of the bottom line. Is stockpile stewardship successful? If it were not, they couldn't sign it. They can sign it this year. The challenge is, will they be able to sign it next year? And the answer is, you got a lot of people here who are doing a lot of the work that's going to be required to make sure the next director is able to sign that and from there on. That's why you're doing high strain rate work. You know, Rasta Gray doing a lot of these things and they're doing plutonium metallurgy work in order to try to understand that. Sig, I want to go back to the beginning of your directorship and ask what it was like to work with the Russians, the Soviets, in, in, in 1988. You had them over to measure the yield of one of our nuclear weapons at the Nevada test site. What was it like to work with a group of people, scientists, that many, I'm sure, in America treated as the enemy? I would say unexpected. <laughs> you know, I never thought. Uh, when I took over the directorship, or, or before even, you know, as we were indeed designing the deterrent against the Soviet, the big bad Soviets, uh, and uh, I'd mentioned uh, the Reykjavik summit, uh, and actually out of the Reykjavik summit uh, came this idea that you just mentioned uh, of um, developing uh, off-site monitoring techniques for the size of a nuclear explosion underground by going on-site and making some direct measurements uh, and using techniques that uh, scientists here at Los Alamos and also at Livermore developed. So the idea that came from the highest diplomats of, of the country was that we're going to do a nuclear test at each site. Uh, U.S. would do one in Nevada, put a device down hole, <clears throat> blow it up. Uh, and the idea was <clears throat> to see whether with seismic signals measured at a distance, one can have enough confidence of the yield uh, of that explosion. The reason for that is there was something called the Threshold Test Ban Treaty uh, that was actually signed in 1974 that limited the yield of a nuclear explosion underground to 150 kilotons. There was a previous treaty in 1963 called the Limited Test Ban Treaty uh, that banned nuclear testing anywhere except underground. In other words, in space, atmosphere, water and so forth. So this threshold test ban treaty had been lingering since 1974 through 86 and then 87 and 88 because the two countries didn't trust each other. So it's sort of classic. We thought the Soviets cheated, they thought we cheated. So the two presidents, uh, that was Gorbachev and, uh, and Reagan, uh, they took essentially our ideas and said, yeah, hey, we, we can do this. And so what happened then, 1988, uh, it was called the Joint Verification Experiment. The first one was the one I just described. Put a device down hole in Nevada, measure the yield. The second one was do the same thing over in the Soviet Union. It was still the Soviet Union at that time. It was before the collapse. Uh, and um, then we would have our scientists to go and measure on site. So what happens then, here, here we are in the few months running up to August uh, of 1988, and we have to allow the Soviet scientific delegation on our test site, one of our most treasured secret sites you know, that we had. And yet the government, the president said, you got to do that. And they said, okay. Uh, so we did. So we had the Soviets there. And that was really, that was the experience that then set the stage for everything we did post 
um, collapse of the Soviet Union because we started working with these guys. And except for the language difference, we found out they're just like us. You know, they're just like us. They love science. They love instrumentation. They think nuclear weapons, uh, uh, you know, are important to deter the other side. They think nuclear testing is important. So here we were uh, on August 17th uh, of 1988, uh, and I'm sitting down in the control room uh, out at uh, Nevada test site, a place we call Mercury. Uh, and in that same room uh, are the Soviet scientists, and we're going to set off our nuclear device. It turns out I was there because it was a Los Alamos device that, that we set off. Uh, we called the test Kearsarge because, we, again, we named them all. So we, we called it uh, Kearsarge. It was there. We're setting this off, uh, and I like to tell the story that it was probably one of the most anxious moments of my life uh, because the Soviets were there, and we're going to go ahead you know, push the button, so to speak. I mean, essentially, you know, you go ahead and you say, okay, you're going to detonate this. Uh, and so the first thing that goes through my mind uh, is that I say, God, I hope it works. You know, because just imagine, we the Americans, we're here, we got this nuclear arsenal, we're going to demonstrate one, and it doesn't work. All right, so that was the first. The second was, I sure hope it's under 150 kilotons. You know, that's what we said it was going to be. Uh, and it turns out, uh, it worked on both accounts. Uh, we set it off, it worked. We then went and celebrated, uh, you know, with the Russians sitting across uh, the big picnic tables uh, uh, out at, uh, at Mercury at the steakhouse. And then uh, the whole thing was reversed, uh, and I didn't go uh, to the Russian test site, it's called Semipalatinsk uh, at that time, but uh, our technical people, the Lawrence Livermore technical people, the DOE folks from headquarters uh, were also there, and they then did the whole thing exactly the same. Theirs worked, it was also 150 kilotons, it had to be close, you can't do one at five kilotons and say, so it, it worked. That introduced us to each other, and then it was <clears throat> after that that then the negotiators got together in Geneva and said, okay, now let's iron out, you know, the actual protocol uh, that the Senate in our side and, and uh, the, uh, the Duma on their side, uh, their congressional body, can ratify this treaty. Uh, and it was Paul Robinson, who was a former uh, Los Alamos employee, uh, who became ambassador to the Geneva testing talks. Uh, and so he went, work, work with the Russians, and then there was uh, uh, one of the key moments was uh, there was one of these technical discussions in Moscow. Uh, and our technical people, Los Alamos Livermore technical people, went there to have this discussion. Uh, and the leader of their delegation, a guy by the name of Viktor Mikhailov, he later became their first minister of atomic energy of, of Russia. He, he then invited these guys to their secret laboratories, their Los Alamos, their Livermore. Uh, and so here we were in 1989 uh, uh, and then on to 90 time frame. And they, we got our first introductions, first into these laboratories. And these laboratories were so secret, they didn't appear on the Russian maps. Okay, so those towns did not appear on the Soviet maps, I should say. Uh, and so they let them go in. They came back with proposals to me and my counterpart uh, at Lawrence Livermore, uh, John Knuckles, for why don't we do joint scientific work together? You know, you guys have interests in these, uh, you know, material properties, uh, you know, under difficult and uh, uh, and extreme conditions. We do also. You guys, you guys do computer modeling. We do computer modeling, uh, and so they basically invited us to join them. Uh, U.S. government was not ready to do that. They were still Soviets at that time. I kept knocking on Washington door and say, hey, look, those guys are ready. He, you know, we should go over there. Then eventually, uh, it turns out, George H.W. Bush and, and then Secretary um, of uh, Energy, uh, Admiral Watkins, uh, gave us the green light. And so John Knuckles and I uh, went to their Los Alamos, uh, a place called Sarov, uh, in uh, February uh, of um, 1992. February 23rd is when we arrived. And that was surreal. I mean, to wind up in this secret, non-existing city and be there talking to people who were just like you, 
had the same interest uh, that, that you had. We found out how incredibly advanced they were in computer modeling. That was the biggest surprise because we knew their computers were thousands of times less powerful than ours because their electronic industry never really came along. It all stayed government. Ours had gone private sector. Way ahead. Our computers were way ahead. And when I asked them, for example, and this is really kind of cute, so I asked the guy giving the presentation about the 3D simulation and modeling, I said, how can you do this with your computers? He said, well, you know, you guys, you have these fancy computers. You got lazy. We have to think harder than you do, and we do. And they did. Uh, and so anyway, so from that, then actually, once the Soviet Union then dissolved, which was December 25th, 1991, uh, then we were allowed to go over in February of 1992. Then that started uh, essentially 25 years uh, of cooperation. And so we changed, when the Soviet Union dissolved, we changed overnight what we call confrontation to cooperation. They actually made a video in 1993 that was called confrontation to cooperation to try to underscore why we had to work together. Uh, and what we did, I think this is one of, one of the uh, just beautiful examples of where scientists can actually help to facilitate uh, diplomatic uh, uh, breakthroughs. And that is because we were so much alike, because we had so much, such great interests in the fundamental science that we started to work together and, and our government gave me the go ahead to say, okay, you can talk to them about fundamental science, but you can't talk to them about other things. Just stick to the fundamental science. We said, okay, stick to the fundamental science. So we did that. We started to build the relationship, and then eventually we kept pushing, and it allowed us to get into tackling the big issues, and that's 25 years of cooperation. And, and what we called it were essentially sort of the four loose nuke problems. Loose nukes, the weapons. So when the Soviet Union dissolved, uh, there was economic chaos, political chaos, every other chaos, and it was a country that at one time or another had 39,000 nuclear weapons and all of a sudden you thrust that country into chaos. Okay, that was a recipe for disaster. Nuclear materials, you know, it takes a few tens of kilograms uh, of uh, fissile materials, uh, highly enriched uranium or less of plutonium to make a bomb. Uh, the Russians had, we're not sure they ever knew how much they had, uh, we didn't know how much, but over, well over a million kilograms of this stuff. You know, over uh, literally, uh, you know, hundreds of sites and buildings. And then they had in their total complex <coughs> a million people in the nuclear complex, several thousand, uh, a thousand of them associated with the nuclear. And then we were worried about exports. So we worried about loose nukes, loose materials, loose people, loose exports. Uh, and so what we realized is that this is a problem for both of us. Americans and Russians, we should work together. So we did. So in the end of October, I'm going to go back to Russia for my 56th trip to Russia since that first one in February of 1992, working with the Russians to try to make sure that nothing goes astray during that time. So far, the record has been great. <coughs> Unfortunately, our, our governments, who more or less got along, you, you know, during the Clinton presidency and the Yeltsin presidency, uh, after Gorbachev was out after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, then things started to go uh, pretty difficult again uh, after 2001 or two, uh, and then really terrible after 2014 and, and the Russian invasion uh, of, uh, of Eastern uh, Ukraine and also, of course, the annexation uh, of Crimea. Uh, and so today, um, all what we call, we call this cooperation lab to lab, scientist to scientist. Uh, that's pretty much at a standstill. And so now I work with the uh, Russian universities, our universities, now that I'm at Stanford, working with their universities, still trying to take a look at saying, look, these nuclear problems never go away. They never go. Whenever you think you've got them licked, that's when you're going to be vulnerable. Uh, and since we're, we are the two countries with by far the greatest number of nuclear weapons, number of nuclear people, nuclear materials, nuclear facilities. We have a special responsibility. So what we're doing now is sort of 
biding time trying to get the younger generation to understand that this is an interesting and important problem to sort of keep the temperature warm until our governments come to their senses and say that, look, we, we really ought to continue to cooperate uh, in the nuclear arena. So I want to go on to talk a little bit about professional society membership and, and the benefits of that. I know that you have attended many, many conferences, switching gears from international collaboration to maybe collaboration within the U.S. or, or external. What is the role that TMS has, has played in, in your professional networking? Well, for me uh, personally, uh, it was most important early on for the young. Uh, so uh, I was mentioning, I went to Case undergraduate school 61 through 65. I became a TMS member in 64. Uh, so right after I switched from nuclear physics to metallurgy materials, uh, you know, we had, there was TMS, there was ASM, and, and TMS particularly <coughs> was viewed as the society run <coughs> by the uh, scientists themselves, the metallurgists, you know, the engineers and so forth. So it, it was the one uh, that was sort of aimed <coughs> at more uh, of the research end of things. And so it was particularly important. <coughs> I also joined uh, ASM. ASM had, at that time, had sort of uh, greater links into the industrial world. Uh, and so I joined uh, that as well. But I joined uh, TMS. And, and so to me, that, that was really, it was big time. I mean, here was a junior in school, and I was able to join, you know, as a student member. Uh, of the uh, of the metallurgical society, uh, and then when it really became important, I would say the the most important and the most uh, was during the formative time of, of sort of my professional career uh, is once I got into graduate school, my advisor uh, not only allowed us but he encouraged us to go <coughs> to the professional society meetings, and so I remember going to TMS and ASM meetings starting about 1967 time frame. Uh, and then he encouraged us, he says, you go present your work. Uh, you know, so I presented my work. Uh, and then um, <coughs> as, as I finished uh, the PhD and then also as I uh, did the postdoctoral work, because here at Los Alamos the sense was the same. I, as you do your research, you need to publish it and you need to present it. <coughs> and I still remember, and the, and the TMS meetings had this ability, they had the best people. You know, they had the people that I considered my heroes, sort of my idols. Uh, and so I still remember this, this, one, uh, uh, this one meeting, the TMS meeting in Las Vegas uh, in, in 1970. Uh, and so I went there to present my work on corners and yield surfaces. Uh, and we had people like Fred Cox, uh, who was one of my all-time idols. <coughs> uh, and he was there in the audience and sure, uh, as can be, Fred always had a way to make sure that he asked these just, uh, you know, questions that just went right through everything. And Fred went up, you know, and asked me the big question about corners in the yield surface. Uh, so uh, I attended then through the early uh, part of my professional career. Uh, I always made it a point, you know, to go to the TMS uh, uh, fall and then uh, annual meetings. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I was associated, served on uh, committees uh, for TMS and then also for, for ASM. And then I joined uh, the other professional societies, like I'm a member uh, of the American Physical Society and things like that. I joined uh, those much later on, uh, actually. So the early formative years, that's where TMS really was important to me. First of all, I was so proud to be a member. And then in second, it provided a platform where you could present your work and then you could mingle with sort of the greatest minds uh, in your field. So you see the benefits for young people today to join a professional society in that they can present their work and that they can network. Is that a fair assessment? Those are the two things you think are the most important? Yeah, and, and I think, to, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so that's the benefit and, and uh, you know, my advice would be uh, join it as early as possible. In addition, what I've seen since that time, and I don't think we had as much of that, you know, back in the early years, let's say 1970s or so, uh, is uh, student chapters at, at universities. Uh, 
Uh, and so I've seen some of the programs and things that have been put on by student chapters from different universities. And, and those are superb because then that really, that allows you to be in an environment that's sort of not quite as confrontational as where you go and present your work, you know, to uh, sort of the, the leaders in the field. Uh, it, it gives you a chance to work with the others, uh, work with your, your mentors from the universities and, and get somewhat more gentle introduction and then also um, to sort of make your voice uh, be heard in, in the profession. Uh, you, you know, that the whole business has changed. If you look at the publication business, right, so if, you, if you're going to counsel somebody today as to what you do, what journals do you publish, what do you do with your work, it's changed so dramatically. And my feeling is, you know, when I get to that today out at Stanford, I just ask my students. <laughs> you know, they know a lot better than I do. Sig, your career has been filled with so many successes and major accomplishments, yet having interacted with so many people, from members of U.S. Congress to North Korean scientists, surely there have been some disappointments. Is there any one disappointment that sticks out in your mind, something that perhaps you wish you had a second shot at? Let's see. As I look, I look back in um, sort of my scientific and technical career, uh, and I don't think I would do it differently. So I, I don't see any disappointments. I, I, I just see it all is I had enormous opportunities uh, and then I was sufficiently fast on my feet to sort of go into the places that I found both really challenging and, and interesting. Um, in the directorship, there are probably more than I can possibly name or manage. I mean, so what, once you get into having to manage people and having to manage organizations and having to interface uh, with the government, having to interface with the public, you know, as I look back, as I mentioned, uh, and you mentioned it, that I was quite young, you know, for directorship uh, uh, at age uh, 42. Uh, and I didn't necessarily have, uh, you know, the, the background and experience as to how to, to deal in Washington. So as I look back in those days, you know, I could say, yeah, I, I think I would do it differently today. You know, for example, I, I'd go and give congressional testimony. Uh, you know, being a science type, uh, I'd go there with view graphs. <laughs> and somebody told me, oh, you, don't go, you don't do view graphs in congressional testimony. I said, well, that's how I best tell my story, and I'm going to do view graphs. And so I used to, you know, bring the view graphs in, and they went through all sorts of machinations to get a projector. You know, that was still view graph days. There was no PowerPoint. Uh, and get a screen, and I would go and do this. And then I sort of watched the members, you know, and they were either scribbling things for themselves and not paying much attention. The staff was paying attention. Uh, you know, so, so I learned. Those are the things that you had to learn. And then you eventually you learn. And as I look back at my congressional testimony, you know, and I had, I had people here at Los Alamos who would help me, and then I watched others, and you basically say, look, you go in, a and you say, you know, uh, Mr. Chairman or Madam, Madam Chairman uh, and, uh, and members, uh, I've got three things I want to tell you. Uh, and so that took a few years, you know, before you really figured out how you got to focus on those things that they can relate to but still get your message uh, across. And so I would say, you know, it, it took me a little while uh, to get there. I, I might do it differently. On the other hand, uh, I did things during the directorship uh, because I didn't have the experience uh, that I would actually say that I wouldn't have done later in life. And so I was actually better off having done them early. And so today my view, for example, of youth uh, is so at 42, I didn't know you know, most of the stuff that I know today, all the things that I've learned in my interactions internationally, nationally, Congress, you know, the administration and so forth. Uh, but I think I was a d better director at age 42 than I would have been at 62. Uh, because at 42, I didn't know what was not possible. <laughs>
Uh, and so, for example, one, one of the most exciting things that we did at Los Alamos, uh, we essentially built the case uh, for the mapping and sequencing of the human genome. Okay, now the human genome is a long way away uh, from nuclear weapons. But we built that case, and, and it was our scientists here. We had good bioscientists because from the beginning, if you're going to deal with nuclear stuff, you have to understand the effect of radiation on human beings. And so we had very good uh, uh, people here. And then we had people in physics and uh, computers that were intrigued by the bioscience world and said, hey, these, these bioscientists, I mean, they're living back in the last century. You know, they're not using modern tools, techniques, uh, and computers. And they said, we can do this. We can do it. And we Los Alamos would push it because if you're going to map and sequence the human genome, you've got to have computers. And we and Lawrence Livermore had the best, biggest computers and knew how to use them in the world. And then second, we had instrumentation and capabilities. So, so we did laser-based uh, uh, cell sorting, flow cytometry. That was invented here at Los Alamos. So it was, I, I was young, you know, second year in my directorship, and these guys come and say, hey, you got to go to the government and tell them that we got to map and sequence the human genome. Well, I went there. The, the bioscientists mostly opposed uh, that idea. But eventually, and so the one person, if you talk to person, the person who made this go was Senator Pete Domenici uh, from New Mexico. Uh, there was good reason as to why we called him St. Pete. Uh, you know, he actually paid attention to what we told him. He cared about New Mexico. And then particularly in today's political environment, if you look at that, he cared about the country. And in the end, he made the decisions that were most important for the country. And of course, he'd hoped that it would help New Mexico uh, and the lab as well. And so it was really Senator Domenici that pushed through the funding for the Human Genome Project. A and as people look back today, of all the government projects that have ever been done, that's considered to be the most successful project, uh, particularly in terms of spin-offs and what it's done you know, to change uh, the world. So, so those are the things. So I look back now, so in some extent, I would say, you know, I could have been better prepared. I could have done this or that differently. Uh, you know, you always come in, into a laboratory, and your tendency is you're going to reorganize it because you don't particularly care the way it was organized before. Uh, and that's a temptation. And then, you know, you talk to consultants, and they say, well, so, you know, you've got to understand, uh, you can't organize your way out of a problem you behaved yourself into and see if it is think about other ways of doing these things. So I look back in the directorship, you know, there are lots of different things you could have changed. Uh, but so it was, you know, we tried to <clears throat> rise to the challenge in the technical world and, and in the interface with the other countries. The things we did uh, with Russia, uh, I, I'm immensely uh, proud of uh, because I think, you know, probably in the last 20, 30 years, it was one of the most important national security challenges. And, and together with the Russians, we made sure that nothing terrible happened uh, in the Russian nuclear complex and therefore to the world. I started working with the Chinese. Uh, I'm proud of that. But that was much, much more difficult. Uh, and it's, in the end, it's related to this problem that I mentioned early on just briefly, that when the FBI came to tell me that I, we had a Chinese spy uh, amidst in, in the laboratory. Uh, and so uh, things started out very well with the Chinese, went pretty badly uh, with the so-called Cox Report. A and then we've been trying to build that back up uh, again in the last number of years. And then when out, uh, once I went out to Stanford, then I looked much more broadly at the whole nuclear landscape. And so I run a project out there that I call nuclear risk reduction. And so essentially deal with, with all of the nuclear countries. I want to ask you about that current work. Generally, though, how successful have scientists or the nation been at nonproliferation international diplomacy? I can't help but notice that the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists currently puts the doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight, its worst rating since 1953 after both the U.S. and the Soviets detonated their thermonuclear weapons. Under your tenure in 1995, it was set at 14 minutes to, minute, to midnight. Is that an unfair metric? Are there really reasons to be more optimistic today? 
Well, l like all <clears throat> things of that nature where you try to capture something as complicated <laughs> as the faith of the world, y you know, with one number, like how many minutes to midnight, uh, it also has its problems. Uh, but I think what's fair uh, is if you look at that, you know, since the inception uh, of, of the doomsday clock, it gives you a general sense of, of where are we today, you know, and, and how close are we to terrible things happening. Uh, so uh, the reason it was at 14 minutes to midnight uh, was precisely because of the dissolution of the Soviet Union that changed the world. The hopes were enormous uh, that things are going to turn out very, very differently. And so you look at, you know, when I went over there in 1992, I mean, it was clear that world had changed. And we still had nuclear weapons. You know, we still had them literally pointed at each other. Uh, you know, and actually one of the interesting things on the 50th anniversary of, of this laboratory, which was 1993, April, I invited the Russians to come to our 50th anniversary. You know, could you imagine that five years prior or 10 years prior? And so when you invite the Russians to your anniversary, you can turn that doomsday clock <laughs> you know, back and say, hey, we're not right sitting there at doomsday. And actually, speaking of missiles, uh, one of the gifts brought to me uh, by the Russians uh, was a, a piece of an SS-11 missile that used to be pointed at us, you know, remachined into a little replica. And it was mounted on a piece of serpentine uh, which is the favorite mineral out in the Urals, where their Lawrence Livermore Laboratory is. Uh, and he handed that to me, explained that it was a piece of an SS-11 missile that used to be pointed at us. And then the inscription on it said, from Russia with love. Okay, so and that's the point when I knew the Cold War was over. So the, the clock captured that spirit. And, and by that time, uh, you know, even though President Kennedy predicted uh, early on in his presidency that by the end uh, of the 1970s, uh, by the end of 1960, by 1970, uh, we probably would have like 25 countries that would have gone nuclear, uh, and, and they weren't. And, and so you look at that, by uh, the early 1990s, you know, it certainly was much less than 10 countries that had gone nuclear. Uh, that was then, we worried about Iran. Uh, Iraq had been pretty much taken care of in terms of, uh, of nuclear weapons. We knew North Korea was up to something. We didn't know exactly how far along they were. Uh, we knew that India and Pakistan both had nuclear weapons programs, but they had decided not to display that. But in 1998, they tested. India first followed almost immediately by Pakistan. Uh, and then, <clears throat> over the next five years or so, uh, is where North Korea came into play. A and then by that time, it, it turns out, one of my Stanford colleagues invited me to go to North Korea in 2004. Uh, and then by 2006, North Korea actually tested its first nuclear test. Uh, and so you could see that the clock would go backwards uh, because of those developments. Now, if you forward it to, you know, to when it was last set, uh, it is, it, so there you had the problem that, particularly since I, I followed North Korea very, very closely, so I first went in January of 2004. I was still here at, at Los Alamos, uh, actually, as a senior fellow at the time. Uh, and then I went seven years in a row uh, to North Korea, and I visited their, their nuclear sites. Uh, and not, not each time, but four of the seven times I visited uh, uh, their nuclear sites. So, um, so, so North Korea, then at, at that particular time, it, you know, I watched how they build it up. And then, uh, as I've recently developed what I call a comprehensive history of North Korean nuclear program that we have on our Stanford website, in 2017, things were really, really bad. And, and so that was a time to put that clock, you know, very, very close to midnight, uh, because my own feeling was, you know, we were right at the precipice of a potential of a nuclear war. Uh, we had a young man in North Korea about which and whom we knew nothing, basically nothing. Uh, and we had a president in, in the United States uh, that basically no one also knew uh, what to predict in, in those sort of circumstances.
And the two of them uh, just continued to raise the ante during the course of 2017. So by November 2017 time frame, uh, I would say uh, that clock captured uh, uh, the spirit, you know, particularly from a nuclear standpoint. Uh, however, hopefully, uh, when they uh, reset the clock this year, my own feeling is we walk back from the precipice. I do not believe right now we're at the precipice of a nuclear war with North Korea. For better or worse, President Trump and Kim Jong-un got together, they shook hands, and they lowered the temperature. What they didn't do was solve the problem. <laughs> you know? and, and that's why I, I still continue to work on that, you know, to try to bring some sense to what are the real issues. You, you know, it took North Korea 50 years, particularly the last 25, to build up everything that they needed you know, for a nuclear weapons program. Uh, it's immense. Let me say they don't have a whole bunch of nuclear weapons, but nevertheless, uh, they have enough. And they have the entire capabilities you know, from plutonium production, from highly enriched uranium, from making warheads. They've tested them. You know, they've done six nuclear tests. And that really demonstrates that they know how to build a bomb. You know, can they deliver one? Well, I don't think today yet to the United States of America. But so that, that's what I've worked with, uh, with the North Koreans. I've also worked India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and the other places. I continue to work China and the United States. Having been in both industry, national laboratories, and now academia, if you had advice for today's young engineers, what qualities would you recommend that they have? Curiosity. And then particularly sort of the, um, the curiosity and the desire <clears throat> uh, to marry the fundamental understanding of something to an application. Uh, and th that's the part that I have found you know, most fascinating. And, and so I, I would say that's sort of a good way to look at the world. Look at, be curious, and then try to be good. Try to be the best at whatever you choose to do. Try to do the best. Uh, look up the best. Go to TMS meetings. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and just keep on pushing and always feel that there's nothing out there uh, that's impossible. And, and then also if you can get the opportunity, and that's, I really uh, had valued the opportunity of being in all three of those sectors uh, because I learned things in each one of those, the academe. I thought I knew academe reasonably well because I was a case, I was a student, and I went through all the way you know, to my PhD. Uh, but in, in, in the end, I didn't really learn academe the way I've done uh, at Stanford. Uh, and, and that is the, the real benefit that you get by interacting with students, by working with students, and then by appreciating just how smart students can be. You know, what I found, don't ever, don't ever sell them short. Don't ever think that you're giving them a problem that they can't tackle. So just keep on pushing them and keep on interacting with them. So I, I know academe much better today. And then the industrial world. Uh, for example, what I learned uh, at General Motors uh, is economic metallurgy. And they told me, it looks like if you can save 50 cents a bumper at General Motors, you'll be a hero in this company. So it wasn't just matter whether uh, matter whether I could find some treatment or some slightly different material for a bumper or for a car body. The point was it also has to be economically feasible. And, and so I learned the economy and learned a whole different set of structures and issues that you have uh, in the in the commercial world. And, and then in the national laboratories, again, uh, you know, at a place like Los Alamos for all these years, it, it was just. You could do anything. You could do anything. Any field of science, there was somebody here uh, who could help you out. A and you could really span that whole range from the fundamental uh, to the applied. Through your interactions with the Russian scientists, Chinese, North Korean, has your background in metallurgy helped you with diplomacy? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, actually, it, it's come in um, in somewhat unexpected ways at, at times, but very, very handy. Uh, the Russian one is, is, is very straightforward uh, because uh, when I did come back here, uh, Los Alamos 1973, and then I started to work seriously uh, on plutonium and trying to understand plutonium, and actually going back uh, to the question that you asked about plutonium, you know, and, and its complexity, um, what, what plutonium does, it essentially combines the complexities of all other materials into one material. <laughs> you know, whether you want to learn about phase transitions uh, or you want to learn uh, about electronic structure of plutonium uh, or you want to learn about the peculiar mechanical property, it, it has everything. Uh, so one, one of the great puzzles uh, of plutonium was that the basics of plutonium, of course for any metallurgist, is the phase diagram. And, and what they found out already uh, during the Manhattan Project, it turns out we hear a lot about the great physicists that were here. It turns out it also had the U.S.'s best metallurgist, Cyril Stanley Smith, uh, who came from Chase Brass and Copper Company, then went on to MIT after the Manhattan Project. He's the guy who figured out that the, the pure plutonium, of which he essentially can't make anything because it's a monoclinic structure, it's brittle as can be, it's non-forgiving. If you alloy it with a little bit of different alloying elements, it actually behaves more like aluminum. So, but that basic uh, phase diagram, either plutonium aluminum, plutonium gallium phase diagram, uh, when the Russians then first started to roll out those phase diagrams, it was after President Eisenhower's Adams for, uh, Adam for Peace speech and the Geneva International Conferences, we found out that we had a totally different uh, phase diagram. Uh, and that just stood there in 1975. I went to a meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany. Russians presented theirs. It was different than ours. I asked them questions. There was no way to get an answer. Finally, after we had worked together, going back to your earlier uh, uh, question uh, of working with the Russians, so by 1998, we were ready to talk Turkey and talk plutonium phase diagrams. Uh, and so in the end, I started working very closely with Lydia Timofeva. And then uh, it took us about two years, and we published uh, a paper uh, together that's called The Tale of Two Diagrams, where we, in essence, showed that the purity of the phase diagram itself, uh, the Russians were right. From a practical standpoint, we were right enough, uh, but then we laid it out together. So that, that was one case where, you know, from any sort of diplomatic standpoint, if you didn't understand plutonium, you didn't have much of a chance. The second one, which is totally uh, unexpected, was actually in North Korea. So first, first uh, uh, visit to North Korea, uh, 2004 in January. Uh, and, and the diplomatic backdrop to that is intensely complicated, but in essence is Clinton administration had struck a deal. Bush administration said this is the worst deal ever made, which sounds kind of familiar in today's world. A and they walked away from the deal. Uh, the North Koreans walked away then also restarted their reactor, withdrew from the non-proliferation treaty, built the bomb, and nobody seemed to care. And that's how I got to North Korea. My Stanford colleague, John Lewis, was invited. He'd been there before. They brought him back. When they heard it was me that's going to come along with John Lewis, they decided to show us the plutonium complex. So I went to their reactor, the spent fuel pool, the reprocessing facility. They showed us all of that. A and the coup de grace uh, of that, and where plutonium metallurgy really came in handy, uh, is after they took us through those facilities, they sat us down in a conference room, uh, and they said, well, Dr. Hacker, we've now shown you our deterrent, because they wanted the American government to understand they actually have the bomb. Uh, and, and I said, well, you know, you didn't really show us your deterrent. You know, the deterrent takes three things. You've got to have the bomb fuel, plutonium. Uh, you got to be able to weaponize. You got to be able to design, build, and test. F that's weaponized, and then you have to deliver. Uh, all I saw is you have a reactor that can make plutonium. You have a reprocessing facility that can reprocess it. You know everything about those processes. You answered all my questions. You know, but I'm not even sure. You know that you actually have the plutonium. And so the director turns to me. He says, um, "Would you like to see our product?" Uh, and we're sitting in a conference room. Okay, and I said. You mean the plutonium? He said, yes. I said, well, sure, bring it in. <laughs> I mean, I've handled plutonium since 1965 when I was a student. Bring it in. And so lo and behold, they bring in this box, the red metal box, open it up. 
Inside was a white wooden box with a slide off top. They slide the top off, there sit two glass jars. And one of them, they say, this is plutonium oxalate. That would be one of the precursors to making plutonium metal. And the other one was a glass jar, uh, a marmalade jar. <laughs> uh, and they said, that, that's our product, that's the plutonium. It turns out it, it was a, um, uh, essentially a, a cone shaped of plutonium with very thin wall. Uh, and so, um, you know, I looked at it, <coughs> and the surface, so again, you have to know something about plutonium. You've got to have seen plutonium. The surface was sort of a, a dark gray color, which plutonium, freshly machined, is a silvery metal. Uh, and as soon as you leave it out, because it oxidizes fast, uh, it, it sort of gets this dark gray uh, uh, layer. Uh, but it, it hadn't yet turned greenish or got plutonium oxide on it, you know, so it was, it was not a very old piece of plutonium. But, but the most important aspect of that plutonium was it was this thin wall funnel shape. I said, how'd you get that? He said, well, um, that's the scrap from our casting. And he said, it's upside down. So it was actually a sprue, you know, that looks like this. Um, but, and I knew as soon as I looked at that, that had to be delta phase plutonium alloyed with gallium because there's no way you could make that out of alpha plutonium. So here, here's the director and I having this discussion, right? And I said, I said, okay, what am I, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, I got to try to find out what that is, uh, but I don't want to ask them directly, you know, did they alloy it? Did they what they use? So I asked them. What density is it? And that's where plutonium metallurgy comes in. It turns out pure plutonium has a density close to 20 grams per cc. If you alloy this stuff, uh, it's less than 16. Uh, 15, 8, plus or minus a little bit, depending on how much gallium or aluminum you use. So I asked him, I said, well, Director uh, Lee, what's the density? And it was so clever. I still think back of that. It was so incredibly clever. So he said, well, uh, Dr. Ecker, it's, um, it's between 15 and 16. And so that is such an incredible clever answer because it means it's delta phase plutonium because there's no way you can get down to 15 to 16 without being delta phase. Uh, and uh, yet he didn't tell me that it was 15.6, 15.9, 15.8. Because if he does, I immediately know how much gallium is in it. <laughs> but he tells me this very clever answer between 15 and 16. I said, oh, so Dr. Dir Lee, uh, it's alloyed. He said, well, yes, it is. I said, so Dr. Lee, so what do you alloy it with? And he says, well, Dr. Ecker, I'm not authorized to tell you that. But you know something about plutonium. It's the same stuff you use. <laughs> so there, there you are. So that's plutonium and diplomacy. They were sending the diplomatic message to our government that, look, we've got the bomb and you ought to care. And they did it in such a clever fashion by being able to explain everything about the whole plutonium chain from the reactors to the reprocessing to the metal and to its density. Sig, you're in your 70s now, and far from being retired, you teach at Stanford. You're active in the areas of international studies and nuclear security, and I couldn't help but notice you're even on Twitter. What keeps you going when you could have been, I'm sure, retired years ago? Why do you continue to work? So, when I first came back from uh, North Korea, uh, my grandson, uh, at that time was, um, let's see, he was eight years old. A and he was in school and somehow the issue came up. They were asked to talk about their grandparents. A and uh, he was asked, so what do your grandparents do? And I'd just come back you know, from North Korea and uh, he said, um, my grandfather saves the world. <laughs> and so that, that's really stuck with me. And so the, the end, the, the, the real reason is uh, that um, I, I think if I had stuck just to the technical world, uh, I would still be dabbling uh, away with sort of the latest and greatest things uh, in the metallurgical materials world. For example, the one that would capture uh, my imagination today uh, is advanced manufacturing, you know, where people say, you can make anything. And as a metallurgist, I say, well, you can make anything 
but it's you know it's processing structure properties and so we have to understand those things you can make different structures you still have to understand the performance so that's what I think I would still do some just because I love my work uh, but particularly right now I mean the most important thing that keeps me going is that the the directorship at Los Alamos really changed my life uh, and what I found especially after directorship, that there is life after directorship. There's real life after directorship. Uh, and the way it's, it's changed my life is what I've found that, you know, whether I go to Russia, whether I go to China, whether I go to North Korea, to India, to Pakistan, being there as the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory opens doors. It, it just, it is so amazing. I mean, this is considered Los Alamos you know, the mecca of the nuclear world. You have instant respect, you have instant opening of the doors. And I can't see that I'm not gonna walk through the doors to actually try to make the world a safer place. So that's what keeps me going. Sig, it has been truly a pleasure to spend this time here with you today. What a fascinating career and life you have. Thank you very much again for your willingness to share your story with AIME. Well, Tom, it's been my great pleasure, and thanks for your in interest, and, and I hope also the AIME members will at least find something of interest. Thank you very much.